Well, good morning, everyone. I'm good Pastor morning. Brady. It is good to see you this 23rd of July. It's so good to be with you today. This is my last Sunday with you. I'm so very sorry. I've enjoyed this July. A special welcome to not only our members, but our guests with us today. I understand some of you have been here before. Welcome back in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Today we conclude our four-part <coughs> series. We've been exploring the book of Jonah. Four chapters, four parts. Makes sense. So we're going to be exploring that amazing book and how God worked through a reluctant missionary and an unhappy camper to share his undeserved mercy with people in need. We're also concluding our four-part series on how to read and understand your Bible. And it's been very useful. In fact, we have a special gift for you if you plan to join us immediately following the service today. <coughs> You'll notice a few prayer requests that we're lifting up. We invite you to note those as we join together in our prayers this Sunday. As we prepare our hearts, we invite you to pause for a quiet moment of prayer. And now as you're able, please stand as we sing together, Today Your Mercy Calls Us. a lot we sometimes confuse them I explain it this way grace is like Christmas getting a gift you don't deserve or even expect hey that's good news that's a gift that's grace 
mercy is not getting something you do deserve. The police officer who pulls you over when you're doing 100 miles an hour and says, I'll let you off with a warning today. <laughs> That's mercy. Grace, getting something you don't deserve. Mercy, not getting something you do deserve. Mercy is on our heart and mind as we confess our sins to God our Father. Beginning worship today in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us pause for a private moment. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most, Most merciful, merciful God, God, we, we confess, confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. And we have, we have sinned, sinned against you in thought, word, word and deed, deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, us and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us and for his sake forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them his Holy Spirit. May the Lord who has begun this good work in us bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. By the way, I like giving people a scavenger hunt all throughout the service. I invite you to listen for the word mercy or merciful and keep count how many times you hear it as you talk to me on the way up. We're already at eight. Did you notice? <laughs> all right. So we're at eight. Keep counting as we continue in prayer. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. mercy. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, have, have mercy. mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us. Gracious Lord. Amen. To God on high be glory and peace to all the earth. Goodwill from God.
pray together the prayer of the day. O oh God, so rule and govern our hearts and minds by your Holy Spirit, that ever mindful of your mercy and final judgment, we may be stirred up to holiness in living here and in time to come dwell with you in perfect joy thereafter. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we hear our first reading for today, specially chosen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Good morning. Good morning. Well, we're finishing out Jonah today, chapter 3, beginning of verse 10, into ver chapter 4, uh, up to verse 11. <clears throat> when God saw what the city of Nineveh did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had threatened. But to Jonah, this seemed very wrong, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord, Isn't this what I said, Lord? When I was still at home, this is what I tried to forestall by fleeing to Tarshish. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. Now, Lord, take away my life, for it is better for me to die than to live. But the Lord replied, Is it right for you to be so angry? Well, Jonah had gone out and sat down at a place east of the city. There he made himself a shelter, sat in its shade, and waited to see what would happen to the city. Then the Lord God provided a leafy plant, and it made it grow up over Jonah to give shade for his head to ease his discomfort. And Jonah was very happy about the plant. But at dawn the next day, God provided a worm which chewed the plant so that it withered. When the sun rose, God provided a scorching east wind, and the sun blazed on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. He wanted to die and said, It would be better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? It is, he said, and I'm so angry I wish I were dead. But the Lord said, you have been concerned about this plant, though you did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh, in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This is the word of the Lord. Thanks. Our second lesson is from Psalm 145, selected verses. I will exalt you, my God, the King. I will praise your name forever and ever. Every day I will praise you and extol your name forever and ever. Great is the Lord and most worthy of praise. His greatness no one can fathom. One generation commends your works to another. They tell of your mighty acts. The Lord is gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and rich in love. The Lord is good to all. He has compassion on all he has made. The Lord is trustworthy in all he promises and faithful in all he does. The Lord upholds all who fall and lifts up all who are bowed down. The eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. You open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. The Lord is righteous in all his ways and faithful in all he does. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please stand as we speak together our shared faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was
was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the sixth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus said, love your enemies. Do good to them and lend to them without expecting to get anything back. Then your reward will be great. And you will be children of the Most High, because he is kind to the ungrateful and wicked. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Do not judge, and you will not be judged. Do not condemn, and you will not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you. A good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be poured into your lap. For with the measure you use, will be measured to you. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. <clears throat> we sing together our song of the day, Gracious God, you send great blessings. shall we? Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and all God's people said, please be seated. Were there more verses? There was more verses. 
lobster diver Michael Packard on November 2021 was about 45 feet Sorry. underwater in his scuba gear when all of a sudden he felt a bump and everything went dark. He wondered what would happen. What had happened, he wasn't being chewed, but he couldn't see and he felt pressure all around him. Then he realized it dawned on him. I've been swallowed by a whale. A one in a billion chance had happened to him. He thought immediately about his wife and children. He says, I'm never going to see them again. But then about 45 seconds later, he felt the beast surfacing. And all of a sudden, he felt himself flying through the air. Sounds like Comet. You know, rhymes with Comet. Flying through the air and landing in the water. His friends in a local boat saw him scooped it up, him up, and he said, I was just inside a whale. Taken to the hospital, treated only for a few minor bumps, he now has a shocking story that, obviously enough, reminds us of what Jonah experienced 700 years before the birth of Jesus Christ. It's a story that seems so implausible, but it actually has happened to people several times throughout history. For example, in 1754, a whaling ship off the coast of Africa pulled up a tiger shark. A man had been swallowed alive just moments before. The captain harpooned the shark, killed it, rescued the man, brought the shark aboard, preserved it, and then the man toured Europe with the body of this shark that had swallowed him to tell his amazing story. Then in the 1900s, another ship off the coast of Africa caught another shark and brought it aboard. The man inside this time was not alive. He'd been swallowed months before, whole in the shark's stomach, an African man you like to guess what he looked like? His black skin had been bleached white by being inside the stomach acids of the great sea. And so when Jonah finds himself swallowed by a sea beast, we don't know if it is a whale or a shark or something else, it was a life-changing experience for him, too. God had told him to go to a city to proclaim mercy, he had tried to run in the opposite direction. God provided a storm to rescue the boat from the storm. Jonah said, throw me into the sea, surely giving himself up for dead. He found himself swallowed, boom, by a great beast. Surely he thought, this is it for me. I'm done. God somehow allowed him to live for three days and three nights. And the great beast took him back in the direction he was supposed to go, sort of like an Uber, you know, moving around, taking him back where he needed to go. And Jonah, during that time, had time to pray and reevaluate his life choices. You know, sometimes God gets us into an uncomfortable place, so we have time to reflect, too. Maybe you've experienced that. I know I have. So, when they reached the shore, God caused the great fish to shoot Jonah up into the air, onto the beach, dry land, covered in shrimp scampi. And this is what he looks like and smells like as he finally travels to the city of Nineveh. Now, as he gets ready to walk into its gates, in a sense, he's terrified. Nineveh is the capital of Assyria, and this was a brutal city. In fact, these people were known for being <coughs> chariot archers and warriors who had destroyed much of the known world. They had threatened Israel no less than three times. And each time they traveled and conquered different cities, after destroying the city, they stacked up the bodies of the dead people like wood 
outside the city gate as a warning to others. These people, by the way, their cities located in modern-day Iraq, if that tells you anything, these are the ancestors of ISIS and the Taliban, okay? Got the glimpse? These people were known for child sacrifice, rampant prostitution, and witchcraft, and Jonah is told to go to them to proclaim God's judgment over this city. Forty days, Nineveh overturned the shortest sermon in the history of the world, just five words, and the most effective message in the history of the world. At his speaking, this brief message over three days, the Ninevites struck to their heart, all of them repented, put on sackcloth and ashes, and cried out to God for mercy. Of course, it may have helped that one of their gods looked a little like a fish. That Jonah mentioned he had been inside a great sea beast, certainly smelled like the sea, and might even the skin had looked very different. Whatever the reason, though, God spares this evil and wicked city, much to Jonah's grief. He really doesn't know what's going to happen yet, though. He wants to see the Sodom and Gomorrah treatment for them. So, hoping that God will destroy them anyway, Jonah goes up on a hill east of the city, and we find him today camping out on this hill. He's waiting for God to destroy it and muttering to himself. Can you picture this moment? I can't believe these people turn. I can't believe God had me go back to them. Gee, I sure hope God kills them all. And so we find him in the burning Texas sun. Well, not really, but imagine that for 40 days in a row. You must really have a lot of vengeance in your heart to be out that long to want to see a city die. And that's where Jonah is today. Angry, muttering to himself. It's actually a little funny when you think about it. Actually hilarious. The Bible's full of funny moments just like this. And so Jonah is one unhappy camper as we find him at the beginning of today's message and reading. And as we explore what Jonah learned along the way, I'd like to suggest these might be useful things for each one of us to consider, no matter what our age, young or old. These are things that matter for each and every one of us. These three ideas I'd like you to consider today, mercy, Discipline and mission. Let me say that in order. Mission, discipline, and mercy. Say those things with, with me, please. Mission, mission discipline, discipline, and, and mercy. mercy. Of course, God gave Jonah a mission. Go to this city and proclaim this message. And he immediately said, no, God, thank you, and tried to run in the opposite direction. From the command of God. Who can run from God? Well, Jonah tried because he didn't want to do something uncomfortable for others. Thank goodness none of us is like Jonah, right? Wandering away from God's good purpose. Something that makes us profoundly uncomfortable. Something we don't want to do. In fact, chances are God not only has a mission for your life, but you're unhappy about it. God has told you to love your neighbor, to sacrifice for others, to carry their burdens. Judge not, and you will not be judged. Give without expecting anything back, like we heard in our gospel reading for today. Chances are some version of that has been spoken directly to 
you're like me, you've probably been fighting and running from it for a long time. But that was God's mission for them. And he has a similar mission for each and every one of us, especially as a church. In Jonah chapter 3, verse 1, we heard, you could go back a few slides, we heard the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. God invites you not only to go places you may not normally go, but talk to people you probably wouldn't talk to. So as Jonah goes to the city, I guarantee you it's an uncomfortable place. As he walks through the gates of this city, that's our next slide, he's going a place he doesn't want to go. Yesterday I went to a place that I really didn't want to go. My son and I were walking around Port Isabel. We've done that before. We like it. It's real scenic. The uh, beautiful downtown area, the lighthouse is gorgeous. On the way back to the house, we paused and went by Headhunter's Smoke Shop. (laughs) Ever seen that? Wouldn't go into it for a million dollars. God said, you need to go in there and take your son. (laughs) And we walked in. Didn't want to go there. It's good for children to see what the other half lives like. And not only did they sell cigarettes, vaping, um, TBD, but even some teas that mimic opioid use. All these kinds of things you could use to smoke and change your body. Even glass things on the wall you could use to inhale substances not only to make you high, but if in large enough doses to kill yourself, with a smile on your face. I spoke to the man behind the counter and talking to he and my son listening in, we heard things that made us sick to our stomach. After saying thank you, goodbye, and leaving, after I got over the urge to vomit, (laughs) God filled my heart with compassion. So many people are so hurting because of their life choices or because of what has been done to them. They see that maybe as their only way out. And if you've gone through same things in your life, you might very well find that place to be a refuge and a helpful place to be. When God sends you on mission, it usually is to go a place you wouldn't go, talk to people you wouldn't normally talk to, and find in your heart compassion for people who are clearly suffering. Jonah, as he goes around speaking in the city, he's speaking to people who have practiced child sacrifice. He's speaking to people who are doing things that would make you vomit. That's our next slide. And he's speaking to them a message that he doesn't want to speak. Now, this message, we know really well, John chapter 3, verse 16, but we sometimes forget the second verse right after. Please read it out loud with me. And note the underlined words. For God God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. God has that kind of mission for each of us and for our church. He will send you to places you don't expect, to talk to people you'd rather not, to share the God who has had mercy on you and wants to do the same for them. When you live on mission, it's exciting, energizing, terrifying, and a life that 
But sometimes God will have to discipline you to get you to that place. God will have to make things uncomfortable for you so that you develop the heart of God. God not only had Jonah inside the fish, not only being digested comfortably for about three days and three nights, and then walking 300 miles to a city full of murderers, but God taught Jonah through his discomfort along the way. I was talking to Dale and Don right before service, and I was saying, you know, sometimes God has to make us very uncomfortable began to get us to do what he wants us to do. And we shouldn't ignore those times that pay special attention. That is called discipline, and it's taken from the word disciple, or teach. And when God disciplines us, it's not out of anger, but actually out of love and desire to teach us. By the way, how many of you have experienced good German women strongly criticizing you? Don't raise your hand. (laughs) Put your hand down, Gunter. (laughs) You know, it's not a bad thing when they do. It's because they care about you and want to help you be better. The time to worry is when they stop correcting. Because then they think, you're beyond hope. <laughs> Marlis and Gunnar are going to talk about that on the way home, <laughs> I can tell. We hear how the Lord disciplines those he loves. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 6 and 7. The Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as a child. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children for what children are not disciplined by their father. Good parents provide what's called negative and positive reinforcement. Sometimes uncomfortable things like Jonah and the fish. Sometimes positive blessings when you do what is good for your heart and life. And that's a sign of love. Jonah on the beach and in the fish was getting that negative consequences. And God provided what he needed along the way to discipline and teach him. In fact, four separate times in the true events of the life of Jonah, notice what God provided. The Bible specifically says God provided a wind, a storm that almost caused the ship to capsized to get them turned around and Jonah into the ocean. And then God provided a great fish, not to kill Jonah, but to get him moving in the proper direction. And then today we heard how God provided a plan to shield him from the burning Middle Eastern sun, protect his head bald head from sunburning, and then the very night Jonah was starting to feel comfortable providing a worm to eat the bait of the plant, so the plant that sprung up overnight dies the very next day. Jonah is saying, I'm so unhappy, I want to die. Kill me now. He's in the process of learning. And God in love provides these things to make him profoundly uncomfortable, so he does. Sometimes when God allows you to experience profoundly uncomfortable things, he is doing that to bless you. Pay attention. God is loving you. We read in 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7. For the Spirit of God, the Spirit God gave us, does not make us timid, but gives us power, love, and self-discipline. 
God disciplines us so over time we begin to teach and monitor and make wise choices ourselves because we want to be on God's mission, because God is building his heart on us, and because we want to do the things that lead us into that better life and purpose, even if it makes us profoundly uncomfortable. By the way, how many of you wrestle with bad habits? Put your hand up, and that should be everybody in the room, right? We all do, which is why a great book was written a few years ago called Atomic Habits by James Clear. I just finished it here this past month. A powerful <laughs> look, book talking about how we can encourage good habits and discourage bad habits by doing just something 1% different per day. We often don't succeed at establishing good habits because we jump into it and say, I'm going to do something big and then what, a few days, a week, a month, you're not doing it again. But just one tiny atom-sized difference can have a lasting impact. An atom inside an acid, atom atomic bomb is explosive in its power. A tiny change in your life can lead to dramatic results. A plane taking off from Los Angeles to Washington, if it's off by one degree, will end up hundreds of miles off course. A habit in your life, say you do something 1% differently, can lead you to dramatically different places. Speaking personally, in January, I asked God to help me put this into practice. I've had a very bad year. And I asked God to help me become 1% healthier per day, physically, spiritually, morally, whatever. And improving my health, last month I bench pressed 305 pounds. Huh. I lifted 380 pounds with my toes. And I'm now a certified yoga instructor, and I've been teaching classes on the island Monday through Friday at 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. One more week. If you want to join us, <laughs> the Art Lounge, SPI.com, check it out. 1% difference per day can make a lasting difference. What is God moving you in a tiny way to try? Are you willing to make things just a tiny bit easier to do it? Or is there something you've been doing for the longest time? Are you willing to make it just a little harder to do it? To reward what's good and make difficult what's bad can make a lasting result that sacks for the months and years and decades. At time. Mission makes a difference. Discipline God not only showing mercy to us, that's our next point, not only showing mercy to us, but working through us to extend that mercy and new purpose to others. Jonah finds himself on the hill overlooking the city, wondering when God will judge and kill them all, and God provides the vine and the worm so that Jonah learns the lesson of mercy. The book of Jonah powerfully written, 1,380 words, a masterpiece. And at the very center is the central point. Just like the book of Ruth, the very center of the book is all about Boaz, a redeemer for them. The very center of the book of Jonah, one key word, salvation comes. God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God sent Jonah to the city to condemn it, but ultimately to save and rescue it. That's why Jonah left 
That's what he said in the last chapter. The real reason he ran. Did you catch it? Jonah chapter 4, verse 2. He said the reason why he left. He spoke the quiet part out loud. I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abounding in love, a God who relents from sending calamity. He didn't run because he was afraid. He ran because he didn't want God to spare him. Are there people in your life that you would prefer God just got rid of? Are there people in your nation you wish God would just... Because God may be inviting you to consider a different path. To begin to share his bigger heart for your co-worker, your student, your neighbor, Someone from the different political party. Is God inviting you to develop the heart of Jonah? By the way, we read in Ephesians chapter 4, verse, chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Because of his great love, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ. Even when we were dead in transgressions and sins, it is by grace you have been saved. The more you recognize how God has shown you undeserved mercy, the more you are willing to share that with others. Now the book of Jonah ends with Jonah acting terrible, throwing a temper tantrum, and it's hilarious compared to God's mercy. How did we get this book? How are these words written down? Who alone knew what Jonah said in the big fish? Anyone want to guess? Elia. One person. Elia. Jonah. Elia. The book ends with Jonah looking like a fool, but that is not the end of his story. Over time, God changed Jonah showed Jonah the depth of his mercy, and Jonah wrote a book that made himself look utterly foolish, but illustrated the beautiful wisdom and mercy of God. Do you want to know where Jonah is right now? 700 years later, there was a man who was sent just like but just as Jonah was sent to condemn a city and wanted a city to die, Jesus wept over that city, Jerusalem, and wanted it to be saved. Jonah ran from the purpose of God. Jesus ran to the purposes of his heavenly Father. Jonah prayed in a great fish. Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jonah said, my will be done. Jesus said, thy will be done. Jonah thought he would die inside the fish. Jesus chose death on the cross. Jonah was spit out, resurrected three days and three nights. Jesus truly rose from death, conquering death in the grave on Easter morning. And Jonah sat up on a little hill, his throne of judgment. But Jesus now sits in throne of heaven, loving the world he made, showing mercy to those who do not deserve it. And do you want to know who is right by his side? Jonah. And God used to write this book. A man who finally learned the heart of God, seeing how Jesus still looks down with compassion on each one of us, our neighbors, our co-workers, our nation, and world small, bald little man talking about Jonah to a church today. And Jonah's surely smiling and laughing and shaking his head. Jesus, I'm so glad you were so patient with me. 
I'm so glad you are merciful and caring for others who don't deserve it. And I'm glad you even work through my disobedience, making me look like a fool to illustrate and contrast your amazing mercy. Jesus, help them to listen to you. Help them to develop your heart, to be willing to be disciplined, to show your mercy to those who don't deserve it. A final thought. In Jewish synagogues, once every year, on the Day of Atonement, they read in worship the entire book of Jonah out loud. It takes only 20 minutes. And you want to know what they say at the very end? Three words. We are Jonah. Say that with me, please. We, we are Jonah. Jonah. And all God's people say. Amen. Amen. In gratitude for what God has given to us and wanting to share that with others, we also give our first and best. So we invite you that the Lord leads you to put something in the offering plate to give online on our website or to talk to Don or any of our members how you can be a part of what God is doing here and in our larger Please stand as we sing together. for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. <laughs> Gracious Heavenly Father, you and your kindness provide all that we need for this body and life, even more than we can ask or imagine. As we enjoy this summer season connecting with family, rejoicing in birthdays and celebrations, let each celebration remind us of what you have given, the blessings of family, the beauty of creation, the joy of refreshing time away, and help us to receive and remember that these good gifts come completely and only by your good and gracious giving. Move us also to hearts of open hands and open living and generous giving that we may, in a sense, Share what you have first freely given to us. Father, we thank you especially for giving us mercy that we do not deserve. We who deserve nothing but physical and eternal death have instead received abundant mercy that we do not deserve. Give us the willingness to go places we would not go and speak to people we wouldn't normally speak to because it is your desire that they not be condemned but saved, perhaps even by working through us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our, our prayer. prayer. Gracious Jesus, we thank and praise you for how you fulfilled the mission of Jonah you are the greater Jonah, loving those he did not want to love, praying prayers he did not want to pray, 
going places where he did not want to go. And rising from death and the grave on the third day as a foretaste of our resurrection to come. Jesus, as you boldly declared the kingdom of God, you healed those who are sick, you restored those who are broken, you brought hope to the hopeless. Jesus, we ask your blessing on those mentioned in our bulletin, those needing your guidance, your strength, your healing, your peace, your endurance, your wisdom, your comfort, even us. Jesus, work around the world through your church. Work in our nation where so many people are hurting. Work in our neighborhood, in our congregation, in our lives, in our church, and through our hands. Lord, in your mercy, hear in our prayer. prayer. Powerful Holy Spirit, we thank and praise you for the children at Vacation Bible School who heard about your mercy and your love through Jesus Christ in baptism and through all the waters in creation. We thank you, too, for the hundreds of people who have been blessed by the decades of ministry here at Fishers of Men Lutheran Church. We thank you for those with their hearts and hands who have built this place and still sustain it and pray for its mission and for our future, future pastors, future partners, future ministry opportunities. Give us bigger hearts to see what you are doing in your world. Move us by your Holy Spirit. Give us spirits not of timidity, but of power and love and self-discipline. You are at work in us, in our greater Port Isabel area, and through all we touch and have touched throughout the generations. Especially we thank you for the mission work through Ed Weber and the Hispanic ministry in this church, for church planters in our area, for partner churches, for pastors who taught here and have been forever changed by what they've seen and experienced. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Continue to do your work through each one of us, living on mission. Lord, in your mercy, hear our Amen. prayer. Into your hands, O oh Lord, we lift all for whom we pray, including those private prayers of our hearts that we lift before you now. As together we pray the prayer Jesus taught all his followers to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Blessed by God, we go forth to be his hands and feet, to be a blessing to others with his name on us. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. And all God's people said, Amen. We sing together our final hymn, and we sing together the word mercy one more time. I am trusting thee, Lord Jesus.